Hey watercolor wizards, Harja here. Today I'm gonna to be reviewing these Magello Mission Gold watercolor paints. So I'm gonna review these by swatching them on a color wheel and also I'm going to then try to use them a little bit until I can see how they work compared to the Schmincke and Snellier paints that I really like. Thanks for parking your brushes here and let the epic painting adventures begin. So it was really nice of Natasha to just send me some in the mail. So here's what she sent and she sent a, a whopping 15 colors. It's pretty sticky and it feels like the Snellier so I think that actually bodes well for me liking them because I actually like soft honey based watercolors So this simple flat nylon brush is good for swatching I found I like setting my colors up on a color wheel with them in spectral order So that way I can see the complements see all the color relationships a bit easier And then I also put my neutrals down the side and that would be my earth colors and also grayish neutrals like Payne's gray and black because they're all lower intensity than the brighter chroma spectral colors that go on the wheel there so these colors claim that they're really concentrator pigments. They're saying on the website for Magello Art that these can replace gouache. And I've said that before, at like 20%, you can use your white to make any of your transparent watercolors opaque, sort of an opaque watercolor replacement instead of buying a separate gouache set. It works for my Schmincke and Snellier colors, so I'm not surprised that they're saying that that would work for this because these are also artist quality colors with really a lot of pigment in them. So she's mentioned the transparency and also the staining quality here. And you can also find those online with the squares showing the transparency to the opacity and the triangles showing the non-staining to the staining. And it says on their website that they don't use one but several different natural water soluble agents as their emulsifier for the pigments. And so they are using honey and guar gum and gum arabic and sorbitol, which is in corn syrup. So they're using a combination of expensive binders and cheap binders. I think that's the only thing that's bringing their price point down. That's my assumption. I also don't know what their pigment grind is. My first color I have here is the Rose Matter. I put it down right here. And I'm using cardstock for my swatching. The color release is pretty fast and instant and very bright. So that's nice. I'm gonna use this Bright Opera. This color is absolutely brilliant. It's like fluorescent. <laughs> it's probably blowing up the camera, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous color that you wouldn't want to use it if you were selling something that you didn't want to fade because it will fade. If you like Snellier, you would like these colors and vice versa. They are very densely pigmented. Okay, so then you've got a permanent yellow deep here. And I'm barely tapping the brush there and these paints are just coming up. My biggest gripe with the Daniel Smith colors and also the Windsor Newton pans that I had were that they were harder to wet. Anytime something is really fast to release color with a lot of color, it's like a paint that I like. And I have heard from some people as they live in really humid climates, so they actually don't want something like that. As far as I go, I love this kind of immediate saturation. I've added in the orange, the permanent yellow deep, and the permanent yellow light. Olive green is the next color. Recovering from some stress earlier this week with a horrible hassle I was having with Skillshare that I don't think is gonna get any closure. So this is Hooker's Green, and here's Peacock Blue. That's Cerulean Blue, and that's also very pretty. Now, this is Indigo. It's almost like a Payne's Gray, and at this point, I don't think it should be on the wheel at all, but since I've put it there already, I'll leave it there. It really should be down on this side with the neutrals. I thought it was gonna be a bit more blue than that because my Schmincke Indigo is a bit bluer than that. But that's the only color so far that I don't like. Now this one's called Bright Violet and she's labeled it as Bright Clear Violet. So maybe that's the, the full name. It's the other color on here, apart from the uh, Opera Rose that has two stars. So I'm assuming it's because it also has a fluorescent pigment. Again, very beautiful color. If you're doing something and you're scanning it for prints or you know don't care about the longevity of something, but also spray it or varnish it with um, a, a matte medium or a gloss medium that'll give it some UV protection. Okay, so I'm gonna do the yellow ochre down the side here, part of my neutrals, earth colors, there's burnt sienna. Yeah, these colors are very bright and very easy to wet. It's really nice to be able to try this without buying it. I only really review the products that I'm buying for myself and that I use or that I already have and I'm in an art instruction, art history channel. That's my wheel finished up. Looks really pretty and if I wanted to make any of these duller, then I can mix them across the wheel with complements, or I can just add one of these neutrals, which at this point would be all four of these and also this indigo, because this indigo actually belongs over there. So these are the core colors that I had. The Mission Gold colors look brighter, but I think it might be because the paper here is less absorbent. Yeah, I don't think there's actually a single color that actually matches. At least we can say that uh, in general, these colors are as bright or brighter than the uh, the core colors. Okay, so here's my giant Snelly and Schmincke wheel. Definitely not gonna get anything as fluorescent as the Opera Rose because it's got that fluorescent pigment in it. But 
the reason we don't use it more or see it more in artist colors is because it's not light fast, which you can buy it. Sennelier sells it and Schmincke sells it too, but they're just not light fast. The indigo for Schmincke got much more of a blue identity to it than that indigo. Taking into account paper differences, I think that blue is the same brightness. So their permanent yellow light is comparable to the Indian yellow or the chrome yellow deep. Between brands, you'll see slight color shifts between same names even. So their hooker green to me looks more like sap green and Schmincke and their olive green is greener, whereas Schmincke's permanent green olive is again, bluer. Here's the burnt sienna and the yellow ochre. This one's a bit peachier almost and this one's more straight on yellow but that's a brand difference. Just from putting it here on this paper, you can see that the spread amount of it in the water is about what I'd expect. Whereas with the cores, it was going about twice as far. That's a good thing. Because I can also see that I can come around this edge and mold it into a softer edge. So that's good too, because again, I wasn't able to do that with the cores. And that was my major gripe with them is that they spread way too fast and too much, like two or three times as much as my regular watercolor paints. And also when you went to go and lift or correct or mold edges like I like to do with gradients, they just didn't. Even in wet and wet, they were staining way more. Like So they were like working with inks in a pan. This is actually working better than that. I like doing weird, silly things. And I like Star Wars and I like Rabbit. So I did like a Yoda bunny. I did a Leia bunny. Lando Calrissian bunny, my Darth Vader bunny, my Han Solo, and that's my Luke Skywalker. And, and you're being joined by... And being joined by Elijah, who is gonna help make this a bit more of a lively Q&A session. I like to add Elijah when he's around because I think it shakes things up a bit. So what kind of paper is this? Is this a cotton paper? You know, it's probably a pulp paper. I'm not sure what came in these ATCs. If you go back to my ATC haul video, we'd probably see. And you can just see from the way that this is soaking in that this isn't cotton paper because- I was just gonna ask you, what's the difference? You get a little bit of a grainy texture like I'm getting now with this pulp paper as the pulp fiber sort of saturate and plump up versus the cotton paper, whereas you can see a little bit of this grainy texture in these pulp papers or combination papers. If I put something down on this paper and try to lift it, it's gonna be a lot harder than if I tried to lift it or blend it on cotton paper. And also the durability of correction on the cotton paper because it's cotton fiber is that it doesn't break down as easily. So there's all sorts of quality differences with cotton paper, whether it's paint saturation, or just durability of the paper. And plus it comes in much nicer finishes, like the hot press, cold press, rough press, and all that jazz. When did you originally draw all these bunnies? Last year. They were doing Be the Fourth Be With You on Instagram, because I like Star Wars, and I thought it would be nice to not take it so seriously this time, and instead of doing something like a more serious and realistic layer or something, that I could just do these bunnies as Star Wars characters. And it all started because I did one of the characters, Yoda, as a bunny, and it looked so good that it just made me feel like I should do all of these characters as bunnies. It would be nice to do Yoda as a bunny because um, it would look make him look even sillier. He's already a silly little character. By the way, I'm using this indigo on here. Really simple ink and wash. It's so much fun to do these every now and again. It's because they're relaxing and fun to paint versus something that's more of a challenge. If you just wanna have some meditative type of fun from the very start, then this is a good idea. If I'm doing his cape right here, I'm literally gonna put one line shadow in here showing it that it's going from light to dark. If it's not clearly able to take more than one shadow color, then don't sit there and try to add more values and just leave it at that one value of shadow color. Because the last thing you want to do is try to add in all those little things. Now, if I was working on a miniature, you know, like I worked for that Befriend painting or something, then even at a really small size, you can add details, but that's a different kind of project. This is not a realism project. So Cape I did for Jareth, it had three different blues. It had like indigo, and um, I think a dioxazine violet, and then a, a, another blue. I don't know if it was ultramarine or something else, but that's one of the things I was saying, which is that if you're going for a more complicated project, then you can definitely use more colors and imply more shadows and more temperature shifts and value shifts. But I mean, for something like this, it's just up to you. If you want, if you have a nice paper and you want to keep at it, then you can add more here. You just have to get closer to it and spend more time on it, but it has to be a nicer paper. If it's like the kind of paper that I'm using now, which isn't even cotton paper. I think it's more than enough just to have the purple here. How many of times have you painted folded fabric like that? How long do they feel like they have to go into the painting fabric mines before they can get really good at it? The very first time. Painting fabric is actually pretty easy. 
So I think that if you do a simple fold like this, which is just a U fold that's coming out once and there's no other folds here, you can do this the very first time. Now if you go to something like, like that sheet that I drew a long time ago that had all seven types of fabric folds in it, and you know, accordion folds and other folds and everything, then it's gonna take you a bit longer just to understand the shading and where the values are going. But for something like this, where it's literally one simple fold coming out like that and doing that, you can do it the first time. Painting a dark line and then coming down along it with a damp brush to get that gradient effect and that's it, you're done. The more I paint, that it just becomes just as easy to draft in paint as it does in pencil. But when you first start painting, it's gonna feel more complicated to paint versus, you know, draw. So practice your fabric fold shadows, um, you know, with pencil first, if you're new to painting. He's a bunny who thinks he's Lando Calrissian, or maybe he is in his universe, Lando Calrissian, his own little bunny universe. This is the Rick and Morty episode where they visit a universe where all of the characters from Star Wars are bunnies. It's a bunny planet, Morty, a bunny planet. Right, exactly. I'll actually feel like I can paint around it and give him a boot highlight there because I don't think it succeeded as well with the soft edges in such a small space. Yeah, I'm probably gonna have to come back with a highlight for the other side because the soft edges just drank up that highlight. Let it just have the hard edges. You know, I'm just really bad at posting my artwork for sale. I always have been. So I posted a few of those things on Etsy. So luckily I already have some black right there. Cerulean blue. Yeah, that's a better color for what I feel like his pants look like. Baby blue violet color. I think it's probably not very common to see me paint a painting that has too many of those bright, warm colors. Like a lot, of, I don't paint paintings with too much yellow and orange in them, for example, because I think red is usually okay for me, but I don't really like uh, the yellow and the orange as much. Beautiful colors, they're just not colors that I usually reach for. But if it's a seasonal color scheme, like for autumn, or if it's a, a piece that requires that color scheme, then yeah, then I end up getting used, obviously, but they're just not my favorite colors. It's making it all look so weird, the shadows, because his <laughs> pants are so short. I think that if you're looking for the best version of something that you're drawing, it's probably a good idea to redo it just from the sketch stage. You should be able to see from the sketch stage if something is working or not. I think it just adds to the whole weird, awkward, I'm a bunny and I'm also Lando Calrissian vibe. <laughs> but if it wasn't supposed to be funny, if he was supposed to be a cool bunny, then he should be like, you know, holding a lightsaber or a gun and posing much more dynamically. Then I'd have to make him, you know, different. But, you know, for my intent and purposes, there's no reason to go and change something like this, you know? I was going for an awkward ennui. I don't know if I got that, but that's why they're not dynamically posed. So for me, this is more fun and I'm not going to sit here and try super, super hard to do a huge amount of detail. Is there any fundamental difference between the white of the paper and a white gouache. Is there any time when it's really key for someone who's painting to save the white of the paper if they're using gouache? I said that in my recent Zorn Master study that I actually posted at the, the lengthier version on Skillshare. For me, if an area is mostly white, there's absolutely no reason to go and put down white paint for that. You can start out with the white of the paper because the majority color there is gonna be white. Now, if you're gonna have an area where there's small places of white, then it can be some other color as the base color, then you come back in with white gouache over the top. But if an area has a mass tone of a light color or white, then there's no reason to, to add in the white gouache. You're just wasting time. And the white of the paper is actually gonna be brighter than your white gouache even. So that's also something where if you can retain the white of the paper for a bigger area, even during a gouache painting, then it's a good idea because it's gonna be brighter. So that's why in transparent watercolor, you don't use gouache, white gouache at all. You always try to retain the white of the paper. The white paper will give you brighter highlights. And I only got to my Lando Calrissian before I got started because I wanted to put him on Instagram as a little, you know, teaser for what's going on here. So I'm gonna do the washing part with the Magello Mission Gold so you can see how they act. And I was actually really, really impressed with how well they acted in such a small space, even with cheaper paper, because this is not Arch's paper for these ATCs. Diane so. says vote for Yoda. Okay, so I see a vote for Yoda. And, and wax paper is something that she stuck on the top wisely so that paint doesn't get wasted. <laughs> But even if you're hanging out at your own house and you want a quick palette, like for travel or something, then it's always nice to have some wax paper around for your paints. It's a, a quick travel palette. And I'm just gonna, it's a little bit resistant to the paint because this is a cardstock, vellum cardstock. 
and it's going to slowly get less resistant as the water soaks through. And not really a good idea. Watercolors on cardstock normally, but it worked fine. I tried it on the Lando Calrissian, so as long as I'm careful and don't use huge gobs of water, it should be fine. For the, uh, the, the figure part of it, I'm not going to be able to do a huge amount of lifting and blending and details, but to do a little bit of ink and wash. It's not that much water and not that much lifting and correcting. You painted very many ATCs. So I haven't done a huge amount. I did that spring nymph and I did those little owls. And I'm trying to think of what else I did. I did those little ribbon ATCs that I did in gouache a few years back. And what else? Oh, I had a little, I had another portrait that I did as an ATC that was a spring nymph portrait. So I actually have to work on that too and finish it. So here's my side where I'm blending the, rinsing off my brushes and here's where I go to get the clean paint. So you wanna have both. You wanna have two cups or you wanna have one that's joined that has both. So I'm gonna put some water down there first, pick up some of the, the burnt sienna and just shadow in some of his robes here. And this is a, a made up picture, so my shadows are made up. So I'm just going to throw them in where I feel like they look right and let the watercolor do its thing because it's really nice for the um, loose effects on an ink and wash piece. I love doing the wet and wet effects. There's not as many effects that I can get away with, but again, it depends on the size you paint it at. So he doesn't have like human hands like a scary John Taniel bunny from Alice in Wonderland. He's got bunny hands and bunny feet, and he's sort of just dressed in a Yoda costume. Even in this teeny space, these colors are blending, even though this is non-watercolor paper. And depending on which costume or rendition you see of Yoda, he's got a darker shirt on olive green, and I think that would actually make a pretty good base Yoda color, so I'm gonna use that water again to his face, but Keep in mind that this is cellulose paper. It's not cotton paper, so I gotta be careful um, about the blending and the lifting. Those will start to pill and it'll also blot like a, like a paper towel and not uh, lift and do the kind of cool stuff that a cotton watercolor paper with gelatin or synthetic sizing does for you. So keep that all in mind. And also keep in mind that, um, aw, look at that. It turns into Yoda as soon as you make them green. Kat wants to know which paints you're using because she wasn't here when you were explaining. They are the Magello Mission Gold paints sent to me as a dot card by the lovely and thoughtful Tasha Bond. And she is one of my viewers on YouTube and she sent me these paints to try out because she knows I like Sennelier and Schmincke and that I don't go and buy a huge number of supplies. And because you guys know I'm not really one of those people that buys products and reviews them a lot and I tend to want to use what I have and not waste my space or my money. It just depends on what you like. If that makes you happy then that's fine for me. It's not something I do but obviously I would like to try a brand like this but I don't want to do that until my supplies run out so probably my only option is if I try it at a friend's house or if somebody sends it to me so I can just sort of tell you the direction in which their hair grows and you guys would be able to do that too if you painted, um, you know, the number of bunnies that I have. How and, many bunnies have you painted? Oh god, dozens. I did a picture book with bunnies, I've done lots of Easter bunnies, I've done a lot of spring bunnies, so there's a lot of bunnies at my house. And bunnies in the process of being eaten by wolves. Oh right, and there's also bunnies in, a, in the wolf picture book, but they were on the predator-prey end of the, um, you know, spectrum in that one, they weren't the protagonist. But you can see this is all wet and wet, and see how even on this cheap cardstock, cellulose cardstock, no sizing, I can still do wet and wet, and a large part of that is I owe the paints, because it's definitely not the paper. The paper's not helping me out, so it's because these paints are really gooey, color density, but also it's letting them slip and slide on here. Then I found that just that wet and wet application, even for the more realistic bunnies, it does like 80% of a fur rendering for you, you know, anytime you want fur. I've done that for my Winnie the Pooh paintings, and I've done that for bear and wolf and bunny paintings of all sorts that are more realistic than this, still in an illustration romantic realism category, but, you know, more realistic than this, which is obviously just playful ink and wash illustration. And I found that this wet and wet, because it looks like fluff, cottony edges, you know, that you can use for clouds and stuff, it also works really well for um, fur. And conversely, so what else is the other way I can do it? Well, I can put it in dry like that and then come by with my damp brush, because I have a second brush on hand, and then blend a shadow. And see how that gives me way more control, but I lose the uh, the furry fur effect. See, now it looks like he's got a Kermit foot, right? It looks like his foot looks like Kermit the Frog's foot. 
there's no floofiness. So it's a trade-off. So you have to decide what you want to do. So because he is a fluffy bunny, I'm going to go back in and stipple. Stippling is your friend when you want fluffy fur. I used the um, the Rose Matter just like it was. Um, it didn't need any help. As you can see, it already looks very much like a lipstick or flush color. So you can see how that color spreads a lot. I'm going to come back and pick some of it up. So I'll dilute some of it down. Because that is still rather bright. If you don't make it for this stream, or if you have to go halfway through, or blah blah blah, you know, any number of things, it's the, the quality isn't so good or something, that I can always, um, I am going to re reload this later and as an edited version. And I'm just adding a little bit of uh, blush to his eyelids there, just to make it a, a bit more realistic. And like I said, this paper wants to blot because it's cellulose, so I have to be careful because there's only so much that this can do before it decides to conk out on you. Flush around those areas where you'd have blood close to the surface. And Diane says, having a damp, clean brush handy to dab and blend the color you just put down is one of my favorite tips you've given, Hashra. Oh, thank you. Stars that I'm putting in, and like, yeah, they'll go prettier if you splatter them in randomly, but... This is a faster way to do it, and it gets it done. And I guess I better figure out where I want my um, signature before I do the stars, because last time I did it the other way. And he was the first bunny that I drew, and if he hadn't turned out as well as he did, I wouldn't have drawn the other five. So the reason there's six bunnies is, in Star Wars themes is because he turned out so well. So with these stars, I'm making them big and small, so some of them can look further away and some of them can look uh, close up. And like I said, it's not a very good job at making them random. You have to sort of spatter them in to make them random. Those are the two so far, and you can see that the purple black, I think, is more interesting than just the indigo black. Cat wants you to do Princess Leia after that. Okay, definitely. She's the only girl, so we it's have- It's funny, she's a bunny with buns. I did make it so that they had some differences. She has a rounder face because she's female. She doesn't have the whiskers, even though you would typically have whiskers even as a bunny. The Darth Vader one, he's- all covered up in a helmet so he doesn't have any whiskers bitten and hold you know with the in the ears there to make it look like he's been through a lot of tough times han solo versus luke here he's got the the ears bending over there to make it look like he's a, a wise guy you know he's been around the galaxy a few times and all that stuff so it's these little things like that that can add up to to give you even for a really simple piece some differences in, in, in characters even though i'm giving a lot of drawing tips and doing all this stuff like that and you can still learn a lot of technique with the watercolor i think people at least for my audience anytime i go to something more simple i get less views and people don't want to watch it i know that there's a lot of people doing simple illustrations for pieces on youtube it's just that when I do them, they don't perform as well. So maybe it's just not what people seem to expect from me. It's a smooth, flat finish, but it's a no sizing and no cotton cellulose paper. It's not a watercolor paper in any sense of the word. It's not even cotton. But I'm sure he'll be a good Chucky, given that he is an excellent Joker. He's really the, to me, he's my favorite Joker, like compared to all of the Jokers that I've seen in movies and stuff. He's actually my, actually my favorite Joker. It was de definitely been fun. Oh, uh, you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of the uh, the color that they used to use for Psylocke and Jean Grey for their, oh, yeah. you know, the telepathic bloom power, yeah. you know, when they are shooting out those tele telekinetic. And it's a tiny enough belt that if I want to add any highlights, I can do that later. But for the little pouch areas here, I don't know what he's keeping in his little pouches. I always wonder that when I was a kid, too. And I go and wet it first, just like with the other ones, and pop down. A little shadow so you can see how it's got a bit of the sepia bias but it's cooler than the shadow i used on the yoda i had a bunny my pet bunny's name was clark robin my favorite star wars character probably leia i know that's a girly answer but not because she's a girl and a princess but because she's a very no nonsense powerful person and i think carrie fisher was a perfect choice really didn't have an ounce of dits to her you know so she was this amazing really dominating female when she was on the screen and that's hard to do when you're playing opposite somebody as masculine as Harrison Ford. I mean Harrison Ford's really hard to be on the screen with if you're a girl without being completely swallowed up because he's just such an old-fashioned masculine type of prototype hero because she was really just amazing. Josh McLaughlin says, hi Hajra, thanks for all the work you do. Oh, thank you, Josh. I really appreciate that. Got it. And I've been putting up videos for five years, sort of like in a Harry Potter way, uh, a pensieve 
for myself, like a little brain memory thing where I can put these memories and come back to them later about what I've learned and how I paint. Good watercolor, gouache, and ink videos that had technique and also art history in them in a way that I feel like other people, at least that I've found so far, didn't do. And so it's it was something when I was starting especially, it was even less so. Like when I was starting five years ago, a lot of the channels that we see now aren't here. And even now, I don't know anybody else who has the kind of focus on art history and old techniques that I do. So I just wanted to do that for other people too. And so that's been something that I wanted to do as a personal goal is to have a little canon of videos for people on here to see for free. So if they wanted to learn it and they didn't have the the convenience of a school or the money for a school that at least all my techniques are going to be on here for people to enjoy probably two years into the future i'm probably gonna decrease how much i um, output onto youtube because i feel like i've said everything i wanted to say done everything i wanted to do and i'm, I'm kind of an introvert and i want to focus on my own private uh, projects and you know put time into that but i did want to have a comfortable canon for people on here so i think after two more years i'll have done everything I wanted to do and I, I'm so happy for the people who have benefited from it. I, I did it for those people. I did it for the people who appreciate it. Diane said, we definitely appreciate the lessons. Oh, thank you, Diane. I know you do. Sharon Nolfi says, I've been a longtime fan of Hajra. The intellectual and practical content of her channel are superb. Thanks, Hajra. Oh, thank you, Sharon. It really means a lot. Like I said, I, was, I had a little bit of a kerfuffle and I'll talk about it in a future video at some point for Skillshare and um, just to wrap it up to see what happened as the conclusion. I'm not gonna go into it here, but suffice it to say that I had a tough week, but a really tough week and it didn't feel good. I'm not trend-based or personality-based or product review-based. So my assumption is it's always gonna stay small. And I always assume that after some years, my channel's gonna be swallowed up by the internet and disappear because how many videos can you upload onto YouTube, right? After a while, before some of them just stop showing up at the top of the search. And I think that neon, opera pink, wow, Tasha, I don't know what you use that color for. That's an amazing color. It just looks like it's glowing right there on the paper. And um, I mean, just compare that to the rose matter. But again, this is a, a risky color to use for longevity because it doesn't have any longevity, but you can spray this with a UV thing. You can make prints out of it. So those are some options to give it more longevity. Diane says the little ruffle folds on her outfit crack me up, they're so cute. Oh, thanks, I had a lot of fun doing those. This is gonna be very pale because I don't want it to look like, I want it to look like the galaxy or some kind of lightsaber is reflecting a little bit on her, but not that she's got anything that's not a white dress on. So I've got to keep it really pale because the truth of the matter is, is this paint is really bright. It's just shooting off the page here, so even at very diluted quantities, you want to make sure. And then that edge is hard, that edge is, edge is soft, so I'm going to come back here and soften that out. And you can see the, the light fastness and um, the transparency and the staining and non-staining right on here. You can see it on the website too, but Tasha was nice enough to write it right on there. What are you going to do with these cards? Probably just keep them as little collecting cards, but I do have, uh, you know, Redbubble prints and also an Etsy shop where you can buy originals. So you can feel free to do that. Hype your things that I just posted those links anyway, even though you resisted trying to... Oh, I'm not really good at that, truth be told. So I think that's one of the reasons why I don't do that is I'm just not good at it. And I guess the people who are good at it are the ones who are making a huge number of sales. I'm just not any good at it. I'm much better at teaching. <laughs> so I'm gonna put uh, two dark passages of color on each side of these little fluted folds. And this only has one type of fabric fold happening here. That there's going to be a highlight down the center and there's going to be darker color down the edges where it's going back, you know, and that's it. And so that's really simple. But if you want to make a, paint something that has more complicated fabric folds and falls in it, then you'd have to study or know about those folds. And so there's a purple shadow again, bouncing off from the galaxy back there, further back and inside. So we're gonna do that too. And don't make it too dark, otherwise it'll make it look like there's a hole from the galaxy back there and confuse people because it's not realistic or large enough for people to make the connection for it being just a bounced off light color as much, so it's good to lighten it up a bit. Let's also make this the same neutral color so that we don't add more pink everywhere. And probably also depurpleize some of these shadows 
to give it less of an effect of it being just a, a pink costume. Because the more dark you add someplace, relatively speaking, the other stuff will start to look more like a highlight uh, reflected white shadow instead of it looking like it's just a pale pink dress. She's got the cutest little weird bunny arm sleeve things going on here. She's got a turtleneck to this, so she doesn't have much of a neck as a bunny, though, that you Can you give your feedback on the value of art school, Josh asks. Well, that's a thorny topic. What kind of schools are available near you? So there's lots of different factors. So I think that definitely depends on, again, your age, your, your budget, and also what's available near you, so what's feasible for you. I think that if that's something that works for you as a personality, like if that's something that your personality um, is going to be okay with, then, you know, if you don't, if you're the kind of person that can't motivate yourself personally and get anything done, then maybe you need to go to school. But if you can do it at home and motivate yourself, then you can certainly do it without an art school education and save yourself some money. Maybe taking videos for a month or two from somebody like Jeff Watts, uh, who has an atelier in, an atelier in Southern California, it's very formal what he's teaching, and he's teaching old master's techniques and stuff, and I like that. I feel like people will get a, a proper education in some of those older art techniques. So if you can focus on all of that as you self-educate, then you're great. But I think if you don't do that, then I think you're going to start more at the beginning and stay there than you actually might realize, because you need to know what all the great people from the past did in order to make your own contribution and strides. I think you need to know what all the great people from the past were doing. I guess the other reason why this is a good idea for a live stream is that ink and wash pieces go faster than straight out watercolor pieces for something like YouTube. And add a little bit of sepia into there too. So like Lando now, she's gonna have all three colors in her fur. And I'm gonna pick out a highlight down the center there. Make that a little bit more brown. It looks like the brown didn't really take here on this side. Because this is fine for something simple, but it has its limits. So over here, I'm gonna just attempt to keep that highlight cleaner on its own. Just want it to be a little bit more dark around the edges so the highlight stands out a bit more. Okay, so now she's definitely got her little brown hair buns. I think that's cute. Bunny red lips. And the uh, rose matter and not blended out so it looks like she's actually wearing lipstick. And I'm also going to add a lower lip. But that looks like that. Uh, just give me a second. Right now she looks like a clown. She definitely needs more bunny ochre to give her a little bit more texture on her face. Like that would be the brand, Wizard Watercolor. So if Josh is still here, I think that would be that would be the brand name of a watercolor if I if I had it. She looks so serious with her femme fatale red lips. I guess when Marcella she also said Fantastico, you are a master. Aw, thanks. And this is like <laughs> the silliest watercolor bunnies that I've done, so that's really very sweet of you. Okay, so I think I'm gonna have fun with the uh the Darth Vader one next because he's the most different, I think. The only one that's left after that is Han. So we actually went through all of them, basically. It's okay if he has more of a grungy, dark sky. But see how I've mixed a black using the uh, sepia and the, um, the blue there? So more than one way to get yourself a nice black here. He's all covered up. He's got a scarred bunny face underneath there. Do you think when the bunny breathes, like, uh, through the helmet, that it's cuter? It's gotta be cuter. <laughs> I mean, it smells like carrots, so... You know, when he breathes like that's that, nice. it smells like... But does it smell like evil carrots? I guess that's a, a question for the ages. Do you remember Banicula? Yes, the celery stalks at midnight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was a vampire bunny. So he's at least a tragic bunny, if not an evil bunny. But yeah, when he breathes, the, the little helmet smell, I'm assuming if you stand close to him, you'd smell carrots. And it's probably gonna have to be put down darker. And not that dark because it's really gonna Josh go over. Said into the verse, in response to no bunny can be evil to read or watch Watership Down. <laughs> oh yeah. <clears throat> the chief rabbit, um, the general. The general is definitely, uh, I always, when I read him as a character, I didn't really think of him as a bunny. I just thought of him as a monster because he was that evil. But um, that's a great book. And if you want to watch the really old movie, 
um, that they did of that in the 70s, I believe. That movie is much better than watching the, uh, anything recent that they did that's a, a film version of it. So check that out, the book and also the, the 70s Watership Down. But can you see how by mixing that blue and that sepia, I got a very cool dark shadow color, nearly black. That's why I don't do YouTube live streams anymore as much because last time I did it, it dropped my audio. See, he's got little bunny hips, do you see that? And not just be straight down because you know, he's a little pudgy bunny and bunnies have those haunches, those little hips. Okay, so what I'm gonna do for his boots is, I'm gonna do the same thing I did for Lando, which is I'll, I'll try to leave a highlight here. And if it works, great. If it doesn't work, then we're going to come back and add in the highlight with the uh, the pen later. But I think it's working so far. And I just want to edge it up a bit so it looks like he's got little streaky highlights there. So I'm going to blend that in a gradient. And you can see that that's way more effective than... I never make adjacent gradients wet at the same time. So I'm skipping the one in between. And I'll come back later as long as people have fun. And again, Darth Vader has like a little grill on the front of his mask, like where he breathes through it. So I thought it'd be a cute touch to just turn it into two bunny teeth, you know, because I can, because he's a bunny, so why not? And also to give that part of it a little bit of a bunny nose shape, that very edge of it is gonna be staying white as a highlight going around the corner. So I'll go ahead and just get the black for the under part of the shadow here. But I basically have little areas of white here that I'm gonna leave crisp and then little shadow areas that fade. So I think I'll fade it into a little triangle so it matches again the shape of Vader's mask. And there's this is not black, so again, you can mix a very good black with that blue and the sepia. And sometimes you'll get a more interesting black than just your plain old ivory black because it has a, a color identity of a greenish identity or a bluish identity or you know um you can even have more of a warm red or brown identity so it's like you know it's it's going to be more interesting than if you just always use your ivory black and in fact if you have an ivory black on your palette and you want to use it and make it more interesting then add a little bit of red to it or add a little bit of blue to it or green to it and it'll do the it'll accomplish the same thing so you see i'm considering whether or not I wanted to le make his nose pink and I've decided against it, so I'll just make it gray. I think I like this Darth Vader bunny the most. You do? Yeah, because he's the weirdest. I mean, the green Yoda bunny is a is a close second as far as weird, but I think my second, I think the Lando Calvary seems a lot of fun because mm -hmm. he's got great style. I really like the pink um, lightsaber. I also think that's pretty cool. I've shown this in my blending edges video in real time. An area that small, don't stroke, stipple. When you're blending an edge. Otherwise you're just gonna mesh it all together with the rest of it. So he's kind of on the dark side, literally and figuratively. You want to make this more serious and do it better than there's a splatter, but also make sure you only put the stars into the darker swirls of color and that will also give you uh, a, a, an illusion of the arm of the galaxy having that pop instead of it and the color will, and the white will pop more on the darker part, but that's also a good rule of thumb for where you add more stars versus, um, you know, not. Yeah, I think what was important was is that if you give him some white rim lighting right here, mm -hmm. and you also give some of his cape a little bit of rim lighting, then suddenly you lifted him out of that black background without sacrificing that he's wearing a black outfit. So even for somebody as simple as this, um, the rim lighting is lifting him forward. He's the last one. We're on to the last one. It's Han Solo. It's hair solo. Oh, this is a different paper slightly. This is going to be... This is a polished Bristol finish, so I hope it doesn't repel the paint too much. The peacock blue mixed with the sepia has a greenish dark color to give him his galaxy color, is you could unite the cards together all in a row and then do the galaxies in the background all at once. And as a result of that, the galaxies, when you put the cards out together in a row, they would connect, you see what I'm saying? So that the cards seem like they were a set or something. Ink and wash bunnies, um, ATCs that are Star Wars themed. So if you were looking for the silliest thing you could possibly watch, then uh, you found it. I did wet on wet for the other clothes and I'm gonna probably maintain that as a trend for this. So let's go ahead and throw that in. A 
this is coming out to be very much the same color, so I'm going to make it a bit more blue. And again, it's doing well for the, the wet on wet here. And like I said, he's got like this, uh, you know, really... I gave him slightly longer legs than I gave some of the other characters, but he is a bunny, so he's got like, you know, weird pant proportions versus human beings, so don't expect too much as far as it making sense where his pr proportions are going because they are going to not be matching up to where human waists and stuff are. It's rather arbitrary for, um, you know, in comparison. But I do, I did try to keep it at where I felt like the bunny's navel would be and where his eyes would be based off of looking at pictures of bunnies just standing up. So it's, you know, it's not super realistic, but there was still some thought put into it and also looked cuter by not giving him super high up Urkel pants, you know, unless it just makes him look like Steve Urkel. And his shirt's supposed to be more like an off-white, but I gave it a bit more of a tan shadow identity just to make it less boring, but let's try to make sure that we still sort of say it's a... I can just, you know, state that it's a, more supposed to be a white shirt. Oh, I know what a holster is. It's just that when you're painting, um, a lot of your vocabulary, at least mine. Like a holster is not even as commonly used as a word because I'm not a cowboy, right? But I know what a, a holster is. But there's other words that I use more commonly that while I'm painting, for some reason, they just completely jump out of my brain. I'm giving a bit of a highlight there. It's all you really need is just one central highlight for something that small. And I'm gonna go and continue that same thing on this side and imply that it's leather by giving it one highlight. And it looks like his little pocket belt thingy here is more on the black side, but I'm gonna also make it brown simply because I feel like there's already a lot of black and bluish colors in this piece. And with guns, there's usually a highlight down the barrel. So I'm gonna leave a highlight down the barrel here. Okay, well, those little things in the back there, I, I'm just intuitively saying there should be highlights there. I think that's just, uh, I can't tell if that's the galaxy or if that's more of his little bunny hip sticking out. So I've just melded it in so it can be everybody's guess to see him have nothing but uh, the burnt sienna and the ochre. Lovely color palette for animals and mammals to have your ochre and your burnt sienna and your sepia. I mean, those earth colors are great. And they're also great for human skin tones, with the difference being that some of these are opaque colors and they don't really work as well um, unless you're doing a more opaque painting because um, they look a little bit granular when you're working on human skin. So I recommend using a transparent color like transparent brown and then also another trans... in mean, sepia is pretty transparent so you can use that, but I'd omit ochre if you were going for a transparent watercolor look for human skin. I'd go for a darker transparent yellow like quin gold and then also use transparent brown and sepia and I'm gonna go ahead and give him his base coat of the ochre the burnt sienna and you can see I always do that line down the middle to give him a bit of a bunny brow but you can see how far these paints went too that's another sign of artist quality paints is that you know she sent me these dots to test and they were pretty uh, generous dots, but on top of that, because they're artist grade colors, these dots will go further than if these had been studio or student grade. He's almost on his way done. And remember I gave him little bent ears versus uh, shorter straight ears for Luke because, you know, he's more quirky and witty and wise and um, been around the block a few times, you know, been around the galaxy a few times. Even for something this simple, it's like I was saying this earlier, you can definitely try to give your characters a little bit of originality and interest to make them different from each other. I think it also goes to show you that if you buy a beginner set of 12, I've said this to people before, that can be more than enough because you can mix pretty much any color and it's less confusing. You get to know your tools. So before you commit to, you know, an entire set of like 80 colors or 40 colors or, you know, whatever, um, Really consider getting fewer colors, using limited palettes as parts of limited color schemes, you know? Getting the ends of his whiskers that have ended up in the, uh, that part of it. He's doing okay, he doesn't have any whiskers. I wanted to bring his little highlight part higher up here and give his boot a little bit more of a highlight there. Um, give his belt a little bit of a highlight there, and I think that's pretty much good for him. He's, he's doing good. Same thing for him, he needed his 
boot highlight to go there and then add one here. And I think he's doing all right too. Suede boots in comparison to their high gloss leather. She doesn't have any whiskers because she's a girl. And her shoes I think are okay not having a highlight but I can still add one anyway. I feel like I can add another highlight here to make it look like he's extra rich because you know Lando's got all that style going on and he's really does a better job of it than anybody else with uh, all the style and swag. Um, but thanks so much for you, for everybody who joined me and it was a lot of fun doing this on May the 4th and may the force be with you guys. Please like, comment, subscribe and check out my website dashboard with all my online platform links on one page, including my Patreon to support my art creation and instruction. You can also check out my website dashboard to get to my Red Bubble shop for art prints and my Etsy shop for original art. Thanks for parking your brushes here and wishing you all epic art adventures.